ordinance. The, the project itself, we've been working on this since about April. Um, we've had some, some meetings with the steering committee and uh, briefings with board of commissioners. They've given us direction uh, on what they want to see this ordinance focus on and what they don't want to see this ordinance focus on. Uh, so uh, this, this ordinance is not going to be like, you know, the zoning ordinance of Burlington, or Chapel Hill or, or, or Pittsburgh or something like that. This is, a, this is meant to really complement the, the rural nature of the area. Uh, and they, they were uh, very clear with what, what the focus of this should be and shouldn't be. And the focus of this is not uh, uh, causing issues for small business, existing or future small businesses. That's not really the focus of this ordinance. Um, and it's not really uh, causing issues for, for people that, that live down here or want to you know, um, build an accessory building or something like that. So there's, there's really flexible related to a couple of those things and really focusing in on uh, potentially high impact land uses. But we did have a public workshop uh, in September uh, and made some adjustments to the ordinance. Based on that, uh, we had a, a steering committee meeting um, and then a joint planning board and board of commissioners meeting to kind of talk through where the ordinance was. Uh, and, and then we're here tonight uh, to gather more feedback from you all. Uh, I'm going to make some revisions uh, to the ordinance. It'll go to the planning board and board of commissioners. We don't know the exact schedule for that. It'll be on the planning board's agenda. Um, uh, uh, this month, next week, and then it'll be, you know, on the board of commissioners, but it might take, you know, a couple months to work through the details because they might have some edits that they want to see and, and that sort of thing. But that's where we are in the process. Hopefully you all got a postcard that was sent to every property owner in the snow camp area uh, that, that told you, you know, about this workshop and then, then what happens after the workshop. There is a, a, a website on there that you can go and, and stay abreast with um, kind of the planning department, what they're doing and, and, and this project as well. This is a, another website that you can go to. It has kind of the draft ordinance, it has a draft zoning map. Uh, it also has a link to a comment form. We also have comment forms here tonight uh, over there and we'll put some over here as well. We'd love to, to get you all to weigh in on a few things and give us your general feedback. And you can also follow uh, the Alamance County Planning Department on Facebook, too. That's where they post a lot of the information and opportunities for public engagement um, uh, here and elsewhere in the county. So um, going into the, the ordinance itself, um, an overview of it, it establishes a decision making process, including what the planning board uh, and the board of commissioner's role is related to development approvals uh, for a, a more intense development types, so major subdivisions, uh, commercial developments, industrial developments, that sort of thing. Uh, the county currently has a subdivision ordinance and some other ordinances that, uh, you know, require uh, some regulations and follow some standards and rules. Uh, but this is kind of formalizing all, all that in the snow camp area a little bit. Uh, this applies, the ordinance will apply only to the greater snow camp area, so the southwestern part of Alamance County, and you can see kind of what, um, what area that includes. It outlines four zoning districts, each with allowable uses, uh, a review, notification, and approval procedure for each of those zoning districts, and I'll go over those in a minute. Uh, also, some basic dimensional and design requirements. Again, this is, this is not uh, your, your typical city ordinance or town ordinance. Uh, there are not uh, really uh, stringent design requirements. We're not getting into architectural design requirements and where your driveway needs to go and uh, things like that. There's some basic design requirements, particularly directed at, at larger scale things to reduce impacts to adjacent properties and that sort of thing. There's also uh, transitional provisions and um, a section that addresses nonconformities. We're going from, uh, you know, we have a subdivision ordinance, but we don't really have a zoning ordinance. Uh, we would be moving to a zoning ordinance, so there's going to be a transitional period. There's going to be some nonconformities that, you know, my, my, my house is on a lot that's a little bit smaller than the minimum lot size in this, in this zoning district. And uh, those transitional provisions uh, provide some flexibility um, and allow you, you know, if something happens to your house, you can build it back. You know, it's not to, to allow some flexibility. Zoning districts, we have an agricultural zoning district, really meant to support agriculture and related uses, and also some limited low density residential. 
uh, rural residential category that's really um, geared toward low density neighborhoods. There's also a rural cluster option that, that um, allows smaller lots in exchange for more open space. I'll go over that a little bit. There's a rural business category that encourages small scale commercial businesses. And most of the formal commercial businesses uh, will, uh, will have that designation in the draft zoning map. That not, doesn't necessarily include uh, rural or home-based businesses. There's a lot of those too that we have some provisions here to accommodate. They don't necessarily have to be zoned commercial. A lot of those, a lot of them would not want to be zoned commercial um, because it's not a traditional commercial use. There's also an industrial district uh, as proposed that's appropriate for industrial uses where performance standards are met. Uh, some heavy industrial uses would require a rezoning. So going from agricultural or R1 to, to industrial uh, zone and obtaining a special use permit as a draft is currently. Written. There's some options there on how to treat industrial uses. We've gotten a lot of feedback on uh, industrial uses and how to treat them. And I'll go over a little bit of, of kind of what we've heard and, and some options there. So this is the draft zoning map as of December 1st. Um, please review and uh, there might be some adjustments that we need to make uh, between you know, now and, and when this is adopted. As you can see the dark green area, uh, that's, that's the agriculture area. Uh, and those are larger properties. Uh, there's a lot of uh, working lands enrolled in the present use value program. Uh, so that's either you know, traditional agricultural row crops and pasture, uh, but also um, timberland. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, folks that, that have uh, harvest timber and have PUD designations, get tax breaks for timber harvesting. Um, and that's really one of the, the key pieces of this uh, is, is to acknowledge the presence of agriculture and protect them from more intense uses. So that's why you see a lot of those. Uh, the, the light green areas is that rural residential. Uh, we do have some neighborhoods uh, in the Snow Camp area. A lot of them are, are, are larger lots and very lower density. Um, and we do try to accommodate those as well. Uh, there are some you know, smaller lots elsewhere, um, uh, but those are the main neighborhoods. Um, and then you see some pink areas, the rural business areas, and the industrial areas are the purple areas. And in some of those um, that you would probably Know, know what they are, um, and we can kind of answer those if you have questions. Um, you see most of this is the agricultural area, uh, and then there's some those other uh, three districts there. Uh, I mentioned the transitional provisions and non-conforming uses. Uh, the, the gist of this ordinance is existing uses can continue uh, within the existing footprint uh, without any change. Uh, and that we wanted to make sure that we wrote in that traditional transitional provisions to be really flexible for what's happening now um, and really think about, you know, uh, what could come and potential conflicts down the road more so than what's there now. Uh, Non-conformities, uh, we talked about this, for example, smaller lots uh, than the zoning district uh, or there's some non-residential uses in a residential zoning district, they can continue in the existing footprint. Um, there's flexible provisions to allow those uses to continue and structures to be rebuilt. There's administrative flexibility for Tanya and her staff to you know, provide flexibility on setbacks and, and that sort of thing uh, for, for replicating existing uh, development. Um, the zoning ordinance compliant, the zoning ordinance only kicks in if there's major changes of uses, uses or expansions of uses. That's when, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I have a you know, commercial business and um, it's in a uh, you know, outbuilding right now of you know a couple thousand square feet, and I want to I want to build a um, you know a, a bigger a bigger business. It's a twenty five thousand square foot retail shop. You know I, mean, I have a you know fifty uh, parking spots you know that, that I want to do, I, I, and that is going to require me to go get a reset. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Agricultural uses, uh, farms are exempt from zoning for state law. Uh, in the county, in, in cities, it's, it's it's not as clear. But uh, in, in the county, um, if you're a bona fide farm, which you get to in a number of different ways, um, uh, you're you're exempt from state law. So this doesn't really kick in uh, uh, for for you all. Uh, with uh, this zoning, there's decision types of approval. Types. So there's an administrative approval avenue for some things that's like the easiest bar to clear, right? You just go to uh, 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 Tanya's staff, 
and, and get a zoning compliance permit. That's if, you know, if I want to start a new rural business, that's what you would do. You wouldn't have to get a rezoning. You wouldn't have to go through um, uh, or a home-based business. You wouldn't have to go get a rezoning for that. You just get an ordinance compliance permit. Even some residential uh, in, in um, the R1 district is, is an administrative approval unless it's a uh, rezoning uh, or, or that sort of thing. So legislative, that's a that's a rezoning. So if I, I have a property, I'm going to rezone it for a subdivision. That would be a, re, a legislative rezoning, and that's when it's a policy decision to adopt or amend, in this case, the zoning map, uh, and that would go to the planning board and then go to the board of commissioners. And there's also a quasi-judicial decision, and this is really for special use permits. This is a, a discretionary decision based on evidence provided. Um, currently, a special use permit in the draft ordinance is required for those uh, those heavy industrial uses. Uh, this is kind of the highest bar uh, to to to, um, uh, to get over for an approval. So this just kind of lays out you know the type of decision process. Uh, you have an application. You need to go through the administrative uh, decision making process, the legislative, or the quasi judicial, administrative staff reviews it, and staff has a decision. And you get your ordinance compliance permit. If you don't like it, you can, you can appeal. Um, the legislative is a rezoning again, reviewed by staff, the application. Uh, the planning board makes a recommendation. Uh, and, and there's a legislative hearing by the board of commissioners. And there's a public hearing and public uh, involvement as part of that. Your appeal uh, would go to justice. And then there's the quasi judicial. Again, this would be reviewed by staff, but maybe an evidentiary hearing, which is a little bit uh, different than a, than a normal public hearing. Um, folks with standing and parties with standing. So it's, it's more like a court uh, decision. And then they make a, make a decision and it would, it would go, uh, appeal would go to the, the Superior Court. So those are the three types. Uh, just to give you a little bit more example, an example of an administrative decision. It is administrative approval of a residential subdivision uh, with, without reason. So if I, uh, my property is zoned R1 and I'm not uh, wanting to, to uh, do anything that's over the density allowed, uh, then that would just be an administrative approval. Ordinance compliance. If I have a, want a new home-based business on my property, then I would just submit an application and uh, staff have to go to the planning board and uh, board of commissioners. The legislative is kind of a higher bar. That would be an example would be a rezoning. Uh, property is an agriculture. It's a it's an old farm. And I want to build a subdivision. And I want to get to the, the density that's allowed in the R1 district, then um, I would I would ask for a rezone. Apply for a rezone. So um, that's for a major subdivision that's more dense than allowed in that ag district. Uh, or another example is rezoning from R1 or residential to business. So if I am going to um, want to build a gas station or something like that, um, then I would, I would want to get rezoned to, to rural business. And uh, an important thing about the rezoning is about conditional zoning for certain uses. So there are certain uses, anything over 10,000 square foot is a conditional zoning process. So what that means is during the there can be discussions between the developer, or the landowner, and uh, citizens, planning board, and board of commissioners, and there can be conditions passed that approval uh, that can mitigate some, some impacts. Uh, you need to move the dumpsters over here, or you need to uh, not put lights shining directly in that person's backyard, or, or that sort of thing. And that's only for uh, uh, businesses that have uh, buildings over 10,000 square foot heat square. So um, that's um, really uh, meant to make it a little bit harder to build big things because that's what we heard about. Small business, it's not a big issue. If you start coming in here with a uh, 100,000 square foot building, then we want it to be a clear process for approval to make sure that we kind of mitigate some of the impacts of that in the area. Not you can't do it, but you just you know want to mitigate some impacts. And then the quasi you go to a piece of agricultural land, I want to build an asphalt and I would have to get rezoned to industrial. And then I would also, also have to get a special use permit. So that would be two separate decision-making processes uh, in order to, to get that um, allowed. 
uh, example. Uh, I'll go through a couple examples of the reasons just to give you a flavor for kind of hypotheticals. Um, and then we can um, kind of uh, finish and open up for question and answer. So single family subdivision, these are the draft permits requirements for each type of agriculture, uh, maximum density of, of one acre for five acres, minimum lot size of three acres. Um, and that's in line with kind of the agricultural areas that the median or the average uh, parcel size in the agricultural zoning district is nine acres. Um, so that would kind of make it more in line with that. R R1, so the resident area, maximum density of two acres, minimum lot size 1.25 acres. Again, that's in line with the median or average uh, lot size in that area. And uh, there's also a rural cluster option. So this is a conventional subdivision that would be at 1.25 acre lots. And then a rural cluster option, you could have smaller lots if you wanted to, but you would have to do 40% open space and then also keep that maximum density of one unit for two acres. And we're, we're talking about the minimum lot size here and uh, we're looking at uh, some examples and we might even you know, do away with that minimum lot size or reduce it to provide even more flexibility because this is what we really want to encourage. We want to encourage this. Uh, it's, you know, less homes and more open space. Uh, and instead of just, you know, um, large scale um, kind of conventional subdivisions um, that, you know, tend to be a lower price point and not really um, protect kind of views and, uh, and be good neighbors to agriculture and stuff like that. Um, some other key requirements in subdivision, uh, agricultural buffers. So new subdivisions greater than three lots are required to maintain a 30-foot wide uh, buffer adjacent agriculture. This is something we heard during the process that we need to protect agriculture. It's not agriculture that needs to provide the buffer. It's the new subdivision that's coming in adjacent to, to the working uh, property. Uh, so, so that's uh, there. There's credit available for existing vegetation that's preserved. And also a highway buffer where... If it's on a, a major road, you don't see 100 backs of homes up against uh, the uh, against the highway. Uh, there would be some screening. It's, it's not a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a couple a couple trees and a couple shrubs per 100 feet. It's a pretty reasonable thing, but it would soften the impact of those homes on what you see every day. So another hypothetical is the subdivision. Uh, if the property is zone R1, density and design requirements meet. Those the standards for conventional rural cluster subdivision, no rezoning would be needed. It would be approved administratively. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, most uh, areas that are R1 uh, are pretty small. They're already existing uh, homes and subdivisions. So most of the area is ag. So if I, if I have an agricultural zone property and I want to rezone to R1, then uh, it would have to go to the planning board for review and recommendations from the board of commissioners, uh, and they approve the rezone. Uh, and so that's where R1 district is probably where most subdivisions would go. And one of the things we want to do is balance potential for growth uh, and, and do some growth management. Um, you know, these, these uh, minimum uh, lot sizes and density requirements are, are meant to balance that, meant to balance property rights for people to sell their land and build subdivisions uh, and also kind of protect uh, folks from, from you know, some large scale residential development. But we are allowing for growth. If vacant and agricultural land in the snow camp area was developed for subdivisions and everything went to R1, so we rezoned all the ag land, all the, all the vacant lands to R1, we could accommodate 14,000 homes. Okay, so we're not stopping growth with this. We're not stopping uh, residential development. But what we are doing is making it a little bit more encouraging the type of residential development that matches what's out there and then also kind of protects some, some things that we think are important in the Snow Camp area and have heard are important in the Snow Camp area. So I want to be very clear. Home based business is something that we, we talked about a lot. Um, there's three different types that we talked about. One is exempt business. So, you know, that's just, you know, you don't even know a business is going. Um, so we don't really regulate that. And then neighborhood home-based businesses in the R1 district and then rural home-based businesses really on larger properties and ag lands. If you're an existing business and you're not expanding, then no permit is required to continue operating under your current footprint. If you're an expanding business or a new business, then zoning will be required. You have to meet some basic regulations, basic standards, uh, and then 
you know, rezoning may be required if it's a really big expansion. Rezoning for a new retail. So I have an R1 property. Uh, it's zoned residential, but it's vacant for, for, for whatever reason. And I want to, to build a new um, uh, business. And um, so it's not permitted in R1. And I want to go to, to, to R, RB or rural business. I submit an application. Staff reviews it. There's a recommendation by the planning board and a legislative hearing for that rezoning uh, for the board of commissioners. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Uh, this is just a, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's part of what the ordinance says. There are notification procedures. I don't know what page that those notification procedures are, but Andrea can look that up and I can point you to it. But that, that's part of it. Each each decision process, really the, the legislative, the rezonings, the special use permit has notification procedures. The administrative, I don't, I don't know if it does, but the, the other two do. Page three. There you go. Um, yeah, they would typically, you know, do that as part of their due diligence. Yeah. Yes. As long as it's a rezoning that's required, yes. So they would be part of the decision. They would be able to make their comments and the politician could make the decision. Understand that. So let me finish this. Um, we can open up some more for that. So, uh, you know, this is an example right at Snow Camp Crossroads. You know, we have a gas station on one side. If I own this property, wherever it is, wants to you know, build a, a business over there, then they would come in and they would say, Okay, I want to build business and apply. People review, make a recommendation. They were to review consistency statements from uh, from staff. Is this consistent with the character of the area? Is it consistent with our plans? That sort of thing. And then make the recommendation to the board of commissioners. Board of commissioners would look at consistency with adopted plans and compatibility with adjacent property and make a decision. If it's a large scale. You know, business over 10,000 square foot, they could put uh, conditions on that approval. It's, it's, it's a, not a no, but it's a yes, but yes, with you got to do X, Y, and Z to reduce impacts to your neighbors. Uh, so that's kind of an example of that new retail establishment. Uh, number four, industrial rezoning to uh, and, and special use permit. My current agriculture or current zoning is agriculture. Uh, and I want to rezone my property to industrial. I want to build an asphalt. So how do I do that? Um, is an asphalt permitted? You have to rezone to industrial. So you can submit an application. Staff reviews it. Uh, recommendation to the planning board. The planning board makes a recommendation. And then there's a uh, decision on the board of commissioners on the rezoning. There's notification and public input along the way. Um, but it's a two-step process. It's a rezoning to be a legislative decision. And then it would also be um, a, uh, a special use permit. Um, it's just another kind of piece of the rezoning. Uh, one thing that, that the ordinance does is require an additional 50 foot side and roof setback for the class three uses uh, from non industrial districts. That's over and above the requirements. Uh, and then those setbacks can be reduced if adequate screening exists and can form mature trees. Then planning board reviews makes a recommendation and the board. Commissioner's reviews and makes a recommendation. That's part one. Part two would be that the special use permit. Uh, if it's required, certain uses, not all class three uses, but certain uses, certain high impact uses. So some class three uses are, are, are appropriate, probably more appropriate for the rural area, like a sawmill, for instance. That is not you know, considered uh, required for a special use permit as it's currently written. Yeah. 
That's um, where the quarry has been approved. Yeah. But not yet. It fits. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Um, so, in order to get a special use permit, it has to meet this approval criteria. So, the approval criteria is is it located and designed in a way that maintains public safety, health, and welfare? Does it comply with all regulations? Is it located and designed uh, to be operated and maintained, enhance the value of the existing property, not impacted? Uh, do they, and this is really critical, does the proposal use the site screening, buffering, landscaping, and, and do what they can to reduce impacts on adjacent properties? And conditions can help uh, that fit better. Uh, and then also, is there necessary public and private facilities that are adequate to comment? So this is what the Board of Commissioners will make a decision on. This is key. This is this is a good good conversation because what this does is set up the decision making process. Right now, that those types of uses, they have to meet a checklist, and the, and then they pretty much have to be approved. This sets up a decision making process to where the planning board and the board of commissioners can deny that rezoning, and then and if and if not, they can deny the special use permit. And this right here, necessary public and private facilities will be adequate to accommodate the proposed use or the use to mitigate their own impact. So, so roads, transportation, infrastructure falls under that public facilities that, that have to be able to accommodate that use. So, so they can say, you know what? We don't, we're not against this use, but we're against it here because that road is completely inadequate. You know, that, that there's going to be a hundred trucks a day on whatever. So this, this is something that, you know, would be evaluated as part of that approval process. And right now you don't have an approval Really. Yeah, you would. You would talk. Yeah, I can answer that. We have three or four. We have three or four planning board members that live in Santa Now there are twelve members. That's planning board. Yes. Yes. And when we were writing this, uh, we had a steering committee. Right? There was only there's five members. Two of them are planning board members that live in Snow Camp. And then we had Ron who actually lives here as well. And then we had a couple of different development pieces, but we had Snow Camp people from different perspectives helping us and guiding us through writing. Uh, the approval that meets criteria Right, county commissioners have final say, and that's by law. That's not through a county ordinance. The state law makes those decisions on how that works. It bounces through play board for recommendation, and then it ends in commissioners for final decisions. We started the Q&A, but I got a couple slides and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So one of the things that we've heard, we've heard a number of things so far, right? From our last public meeting, online feedback. Um, so some of the changes we've made based on public feedback so far uh, is we did add the conditional zoning process. 
for certain uses. So mobile home parks, campgrounds, and larger scale commercial. Because what we're hearing is we don't care so much about small business. It's not really a big concern. A larger scale business, let's put some, you know, uh, some decision making process in place to, you know, make sure that that the redu- re- impacts can be reduced. On. So that conditional zoning process is just for new commercial buildings over 10,000 square foot. It, we, put, we put that in. We added public notification procedures for legislative and quasi judicial processes to make sure that that was covered. We updated the table of permitted uses, which allowed the use of these district and industrial zoning district to match the full title of the heavy industry development ordinance one, two, and three, just so it's clear. Uh, we also relax some regulations on residential and commercial uses because we heard that, you know, hey, we don't need to be, you know, so restrictive on require so much landscaping new residential subdivisions or, or parking lots or anything like that. So we really kind of scaled those back. Um, and then we're double checking cross references, including stuff to the heavy industrial development requirement. Um, so th- those are some things that we've made, some things that we're talking about. Uh, it is the heavy industrial uses, how to treat those in snow camp. Right now, the current draft of the ordinance, as I've gone through in a couple of these hypotheticals, uh, requires rezoning and then a special use permit for most class three industrial uses. So those are really the heavy impact uses, mining, racetracks, asphalt plants, and paper. So uh, it's, it doesn't prohibit them in this area outright, but it makes it really a lot harder uh, to be approved. Right now, if you know, all you have to do is do a checklist and make sure that your, your development proposal uh, accommodates the, the, the standards and you're approved, whereas this is going to have to get rezoned. And then in order to meet rezoning, you have to meet all these other requirements, and then you have to get a special use permit. So there's two decision-making processes that makes it higher uh, for certain certain types of uses in the area, but also, you know, uh, they could be approved if, if it makes sense. Um, now an alternative would be to, to not. So that's that's something that we have heard some feedback on. Uh, one, uh, one to just not permit some class three uses. And that's certainly an option. Uh, the steering committee members, we, talk, we talked about this at length, and uh, they were kind of split. Uh, some of them wanted to, to still allow uh, you know, that approval to happen, but still have a high bar like we're proposing. And then some would like to remove and, and prohibit class three uses altogether. So that's one of the things that we really want to get some feedback uh, here tonight. And, and kind of as we move forward, there is on the comment form, there's two questions. One is about these class three uses. How would you do you like the approach of just having having a higher bar and, and increasing kind of the, the transparency and decision making process, or do you want to prohibit all or certain class three uses? Um, so that's the question on there. Uh, and then we also have a question about what's your priority for residential and concerns about that. Um, you know, one of the things we have talked about is this, this rural cluster development that allows less than lot size in exchange for this 40% open space. So you don't necessarily get this, but you get something more like that, clustered home sites, uh, protection of some natural resources. Uh, and we're working with staff to evaluate standards for that. Uh, and so we wanna hear what's your, what's your biggest priority for residential development? Is it, is it overall density? Is it protection of open space or whatever? And we can kind of use that to fine tune some of those recommendations. Um, the next steps for this, Planning board is going to review, start reviewing the draft ordinance and discuss changes based on uh, feedback. We don't know whether that's just going to be January. That might be January and February. Uh, but uh, right now, we're taking the planning board, and eventually the board of commissioners will see and hear the ordinance uh, and make a decision on it. We don't know if that's going to be February or March. be a public hearing as part of that process. Um, so, what we do now, uh, 10 minutes of general questions, and then we'll break up. And we can have a smaller group discussion here and maybe there, and then also over the boards and at the MAC. Um, and we also want to make sure that you take the survey, comment form, and submit that. Um, and yeah, so that's it. Yeah. I said, well, I don't know.
Well, I mean, you know, well, I mean, I think what, that's what we want to hear tonight. If there's certain sets of class for use, it's like paper mills or concrete plants that you just you're concerned about, let us know. Um, and we're not proposing any right now, just to make that clear. <laughs> we're, doing, we're, we're just setting up a framework that's a better decision making process, I think, uh, to where there's more, there's more notification and more decision making process, more decision decisions that need to be made to approve such things. Right now, that's not enough. Right now, they can come in, fill the checklist, and they can do what they want. So we're trying to put more protections in place uh, related to that. Yes, already in place, like for heavy industrial 65, those standards must be met first You're right. before you go. All right, you want to do that? All the state laws, the state laws change June of 2021. So in June of 2021, we had to pull all the 61 pieces together, which was our subdivision, our floodplain, our watershed, and our heavy industrial work. Pull that into what we call the development ordinance. All those ordinances and language were brought to one um, single ordinance. So in there, what the bill is talking about is this zoning fit into the studio. We say the chapter there. So there are certain things that are already written by a county ordinance that gets guidance with the heavy industrial, with your subdivisions, with watershed things. This all of Zoning will be part of Snow Camp, and anything that's not specifically written in the Snow Camp zoning ordinance that's in the Utah Development Ordinance also applies. So, any protection of water, any well protection, septic standards, anything that would raise for state permits before we give somebody a permit for an industrial use or anything else, that is already in our Utah Development Ordinance and would already be required in addition to what we're writing here. And so, that all falls together. There's some, you know, pretty and the environmental property size and distance from residences and stuff like that it's where you know it, it makes it difficult to probably to do some of those things uh, uh, already and what we're doing is adding you know, two two decisions on top of it you got to get a rezoning and a special use permit on top of meeting that criteria so it's not the either or thing it's not that you just need to get a rezoning it's you get a rezoning you have to meet all the, the requirements in section 6.5 that sort of thing too. So it's, it's additive. Really, y'all have more. Y'all will have a little bit more kind of protection uh, than other parts of the county as of right now. Right. So this is only written for what is not the county. You know, the county. Other parts of the county won't have zoning. They won't have anything like this. This is very specific to this area. Commissioners, previous commissioners, and current commissioners asked us to step in and write something specific to the camp that started in our land development plan and has come to fruition with lots of detail in the zoning order. So when you get out of the boundaries that we show on that map, the rest of the county just has other general county ordinances. They wouldn't have these specifics and protections of the people that live there. Only this area. Mm -hmm. We have a small business uh, considered a home business. Uh, all employees are family members, etc. Um, 
but the current limitation on the size as it's written today is 3,500 square feet per additional building kind of situation. And to my sense of it, if I was a small business person, maybe a contractor or an APC company or something like that, 3,500 square feet starts looking pretty small. And so I was suggesting, you know, maybe 6,000 feet. We want to build 5,000 feet for the building to find out current location. You know, we're on enough land, it's not going to be a little bit more than Good change would make a big difference. Historically, you know, way, way back, in this very entrepreneurial area, it was just that got lost a hundred years. Part of that was the rumor of business bringing it to you. And I don't think that part of it. <laughs> and, and I think I was telling you that. I mean, I, I think these home-based businesses are not really a focus uh, of, you know, what we're really trying to do with the ordinance is restrict. We're not trying to restrict home-based business, right? We want to be flexible on that. I think finding a, a happy medium of uh, allowing home-based business on, on larger properties um, and, and, and still requiring some rezoning for really big stuff. Right, but, but we could certainly uh, look at that threshold, and it, it probably needs to be more than thirty-five because you're you're giving a, a real-world example uh, that makes sense. Yeah. What other what other questions do we have? General questions. It sounds to me, though it's just if I understand it. If we're a private property owner in Snow County and we're willing to get permits and go before boards and everything, uh, we might can do with our property what we wanted to. But we're basically losing some of our private property rights that people outside this district are still going to have. Well, I mean, like I said, you know, it's always a balance uh, of, of private property rights and protection of your rights you know, based on what could go on your neighbor's property. Right? So, I mean, property rights can go both ways. Uh, me doing what I want, but also being protected against something detrimental, you know, right over my property. I'd rather protect my property myself than the county government than some of my neighbors. Yeah. Well, as part of that, I know you all have heard of the Randolph County Industrial Site and how that speaks to them. There is some quite a bit of speculation that that development is going to do in terms of this section of the county. And there could be development coming very quickly in the next couple of years to build that some of this land that is not built out. There's water and sewer lines that are not very far from the county line that can be brought over and could really impact this area. So timing of this was not intentional to that Randolph County site, but the timing of this could be critical if we're trying to protect against something coming back across there that has to do with that industrial development. I just don't want the government protecting me. Okay. Yep. Certainly, one of those things that you know it's, it didn't draft more than fifty percent. We all think it should be higher, uh, and that's not up. You know, it could be one hundred percent, could be one hundred and fifty percent. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, and then, and, and also keep in mind that does not um, affect agricultural lands. So, if you do have an agricultural property that's bona fide farm, you can build another dwelling. So it won't be well not affect that because the steering committee got into that because they said, well, there's a lot of farms that, you know, had to do Airbnb or second home for 
kind of seasonal lodging or, or that sort of thing, and that would not impact those. So it really is just properties that are not a bona fide farm. Uh, we're putting, you know, uh, some boundaries. So our officials are not set up geographically. They're at large for the entire county. All commits, all of our clinic board members represent all sections. We have 12 members right now. We have a 13 member board, but we have one vacancy right now. They meet only once a month. So January 13th is their very next meeting. That's their very next meeting, but they meet the second Thursday of every month. Yes, ma'am. And also, if that's something that you want to, to say on the comment card, you know, you think that, you know, accessory dwelling size, there should be a larger a lot. Give, give us an example. If it's a square footage or if it's a percentage or however you want to do it. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, we were just wanting to put some boundaries so someone doesn't have you know, 10 accessory clients and essentially a subdivision on a property without going through the, you know, approval process. So, you know, there's probably, a, you know, some, some flexibility there, but we don't want to provide too flexibility because then you're going to end up with a mobile home park beside you and you didn't realize it. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Well, yeah, that's a bit of a it's not necessarily taking into account access and you know, other, other things like site. It's just a building. So, um, my so if it's a, it's a bona fide farm, uh, then there's more flexibility than if you're you know just a you know, building something that's not being used for agricultural purposes. There are best practices, and do you want to speak to that? Yeah, there's best management practices that are done through the state and trickle down through us. There's buffers for streams or 50 foot buffers from edge of stream out uh, if they're recognized on those geology layers. And if you are got any floodplain on the property, you have to stay out of that as well or get a special permit for elevation and everything on that. So depending on what you're building up against, there are different types of permits. If you're in a watershed and not agricultural, and you want to build out with over 12% of pervious surface, you have to get a special permit for that. So those are being monitored. Like I said, it really comes down to the state, but it's effective in our ordinances as well. And the fact of the matter, state is not very restrictive related to water quality compared to some other some other states. Yeah, I think we mentioned. Yeah, you've got your setback buffer to take the off the bottom. And if you're floodplain, you can choose to try to floodplain and you have an elevation certificate and you have uh, engineers have to get involved with that. So we do have some language in our regular ordinances that are not in this specific zoning that would still apply. They push you away from the waterways and they protect how much can be built on a piece of property that's in a water sample, which would be a drinking source. All of those things are already in our ordinance. And, and that's really an existing ordinance. So this ordinance in particular um, it is, is trying to, to use more of an incentive base, for, particularly for residential, you know, reducing impacts on groundwater and water, water quality and that sort of thing. If you look at these two subdivision graphics, this is how subdivisions are typically done, and there's some subdivisions in Allen's County that are like this conventional subdivision. And typically, what happens, developer will come in and clear all the trees, grade everything. Uh, in respect, maybe this is a jurisdictional stream; they would have to keep a little bit of you know, foot buffer there. Uh, but it is inadequate to, to truly protect water quality. 
lawns. So you're going to get sedimentation. You're going to get runoff from roads. You're going to get nitrogen, phosphorus from lawns, all that. Uh, that's why I think it's important that we encourage these rural cluster subdivisions and incentivize uh, some of the things that we want open space to be in near some bodies of water and streams and that sort of thing. And, and this way, we're using it as a process. You don't have to do this, but there's some really benefits to doing this because you can have small lots and more flexibility with your site design. Uh, so this is what we're, we're kind of incentivizing, not requiring. You can do that. You can incentivize things, you just can't require them. So the state regulates a lot of that stream. If you disturb a stream, realign a stream, you have to go through the state and through us to get additional permitting. But just run off of things like that. We have some language, they have some language. It's probably more basic than what most people would want, but that's all that they have for us to do. Yeah. Can you be stricter? Yeah. On some things they can, and on some things they can't. For instance, they have to approve. They have, yeah, it has to be expressly permitted. Like, uh, you know, you can't have a 200 foot buffer requirement on streams. That is something they has explicitly said that you can only have a 50 foot buffer. And that's it. So if you want more, you got to incentivize for something else. Uh, but there's other things that the, the, the county could do. There's impervious surface maximums that some zoning codes have in it. They have an impervious surface maximum. This is not super relevant here because we're working with bigger properties and we're not really encouraging or allowing very small lots. Uh, but if you know, that is something that you could do is, is limit impervious surface on a property to 50%. But again, that wasn't really the focus, the charge that you're given to regulate an impervious surface on residential properties. That wasn't really a, a big concern down here. Uh, we are setting up the framework for it, uh, so if it becomes an issue, you know, it certainly could be revisited uh, in the future, but that's not something that we're, we're worried about right now. So currently, your minimum lot size is 30,000 square feet and three quarters of an acre, unless you're a water shed and that could change it to an acre or two acres. But just break our land, you're at 30,000. For right now, yes, sir. And, and that's if it perks through um, environmental health. If you need, you may need for land to get the soil to work in, to get the well and everything separated, but that's just our minimum. This, and, that, that, and that's based on really like current regulations, we are saying that we probably should increase the lot size uh, down here uh, to be 1.25 acres for our one district and then, uh, uh, three acres in the agricultural area. Uh, the steering committee did give us direction to look at family exemptions though. Um, and that was something that they felt strongly about. Uh, and that's something that we're probably gonna recommend you know, to the planning board that for a certain number of lots, uh, you, you, could, you could have as long as it you know, meets that, you know, probably the three, three quarter acre requirement. Uh, and if it's a family subdivision of certain numbers, that's probably what we're going to recommend to provide a little bit more flexibility for the family subdivision. Yes, So the ordinance if approved will have a chapter within our unified development ordinance. So quarrying and things like that are in the heavy industrial section of the current unified development ordinance. And then this new camp would be another section within that unified development ordinance. Uh, I really can't talk about that project in particular. I don't have that information right in front of me. Uh, we can have that conversation offline, or you're welcome to give me a call or whatever in the office. I don't have the information right from you. Yeah. 
If, if you want to say that as a comment, to, you know, that could be part of this no game ordinance is hours restriction of lasting. That could be something we can take now, but specifically related to Corey. Discussion. Uh, there'll be somebody here and then also over here uh, in front of the, the easels. But I really appreciate y'all coming and, and thank you so much for taking time. Andrea, you want to take, take that? 